So welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your extensive break. Um, I'm happy to introduce Roger, who will be hosting and chairing the next session. And I uh, continue to encourage everyone to ask your questions in the chat. It's been working out very well, um, including the younger people. And hopefully after all the talks are over, we, we will have time for about 20, 30 minutes of discussion about them, followed by another diversity panel. So thanks, Mark, it's up to you now. So um, yeah, I'm Roger Quinn, and um, I'm, I'm the uh, session chair for uh, session three on motor control. And we're going to do the same thing we did this morning. We're going to have eight presentations pre-recorded, and we're just going to run right through them. And then after that, there'll be questions and answers. And uh, please do, uh, uh, as you think of questions, please uh, put them right in the chat, and uh, I'll try to record those uh, and you know keep track of them. And, and use those in the question and answer period. So, uh, Kelly, you, you can please uh, start rolling. Our new Neuronex network focuses on communication coordination control in neuromechanical systems, or CQNS. Our fundamental question is how do biological nervous systems control and execute interactions with the environment? Animals of all sizes and speeds must solve this problem to survive. Our network seeks to create a conceptual modeling framework that can predict control for organisms of different size and speed scales, no matter their phyla. Organism-specific models will be developed from organism-specific experiments. That data will inform our scale-dependent model and hypotheses will be developed and tested in further animal experiments. Our network is organized in four IRGs. IRG 2, 3, and 4 are shown in columns on this table whereas IRG1 is shown in the orange row at the top. Modelers in IRG1 are also members of the other IRGs, thus data is shared continuously. Ansgar Bushkis will present IRG2 on fruit fly, Hillel Cheel and Vicky Wester Wood will present IRG3 on sea slug, and Matt Tresh will present IRG4 on rats and cats. IRG1 is using dynamic scaling theory to relate results from the other IRGs to address a foundational question. Scale-dependent com computational neuroscience and biomechanical models will be integrated and organismal commonalities will be investigated and tested in robots. Since our proposal submission, IRG1 has been working on our first specific aim, improving biomechanical scaling theory. We are concentrating on, on oscillating behaviors such as leg cycles. It's well known that mass, viscosity, and elasticity scale differently and that the damping ratio in a joint increases with decreasing animal size. Fundamental linear oscillation theory results in this length versus time plot. Length is size of the animal and time is a period of oscillation. The plot is divided into regions. Above the horizontal line, oscillations are underdamped and free vibration can occur. The natural frequency line separates the regions B and C. In the yellow large and fast region, muscle force is converted primarily into kinetic energy. In the red slow region, Muscle force converts to elastic potential energy. In the orange small fast region, E, muscle force is dissipated by viscous effects. To predict, how, to predict how neural control might vary across scales, we are compiling rhythmic animal behaviors on this length versus time chart, including walking legs and sea slug feeding. Different animals' motions that look similar may be controlled by radically different means. We have chosen to study animals that fall into different regions on this dynamic scale plot. The fruit fly walking behavior extends across the viscous and quasi-static regions. The sea slug feeding behavior is deep in the quasi-static region. The rat is in the quasi-static region, but very near the underdamped, overdamped border. The cat is over underdamped and crosses a kinetic quasi-static border. We think these different biomechanical regions pose distinct problems for neural control. And that is a key hypothesis that will be tested by our work. We plan to refine in detail this network blueprint, which shows the interactions between the higher level centers, the motor center, the body, and the environment. We're particularly interested in how ascending and descending information between higher and lower centers orchestrate behaviors. IRG3 will study ascending and descending commands in a quasi-static behavioral system. Hi. I'm Dr. Hillel Cheel, and I co-lead IRG3. Hi, I'm Dr. Vicki Websterwood, and I also co-lead IRG3. IRG3 has three aims. First, 
model the neuromechanics of a quasi-static system, and determine commands for behavior in both simulation and in a robotic grasper using a synthetic nervous system. Second, experimentally measure control commands as an animal changes in size. Third, compare control by synthetic nervous systems to control by deep neural networks. In a mechanical system, when opposing forces are balanced, the system is quasi-static, like two well-matched teams in a tug of war. The movements are near mechanical equilibrium. This poses different control challenges than viscous movements, like walking through molasses, or ballistic movements, like throwing a baseball. The quasi-static system we are studying is the grasper that allows the marine mollusk Aplysia californica to ingest seaweed. Using MRI, we visualize the grasper and intact animals to construct models of the movements, kinematic models, and of the forces, kinetic models. We also constructed an initial grasper robot. We will increase grasper flexibility by allowing it to open and close, and by creating flexible grasping surfaces that conform to and securely grasp slippery materials. Synthetic nervous systems, based on the neural architecture of feeding and aplysia, will be combined with simulated and robotic models to create neuromechanical models. These models will subject hypotheses for control commands to adjust grasper behavior depending on what it is trying to ingest. Specific AIM-2 will experimentally test control hypotheses from specific AIM-1. Using a novel technology developed in a previous Neuronext project by Dr. Cynthia Shestick, carbon fiber arrays, we can record activity in many neurons simultaneously. Carbon fibers can be inserted into nerve cells to stimulate or inhibit them, allowing direct circuit function analysis. To study ascending and descending commands, another array can be placed in the nerve cells responsible for higher order commands. Aplysia grow from less than one milligram to over 1,000 grams. So we can study how control commands change as an animal grows by orders of magnitude. In aplysia, we can characterize the biological neural network at the level of individual identified neurons. So we can compare this ground truth control captured by synthetic nervous systems to control by deep neural networks. Thus, IRG3 has three overall goals. First, understand coordination, communication, and control in a quasi-static system. Second, create a flexible grasper device based on a biological system that can rapidly adjust to changing environmental conditions. And third, create a methodology for developing deep neural networks whose components can be explained in terms of an underlying neurobiological architecture. Thank you for listening. So IRG4 will continue the study of scale-dependent motor control by examining sensory motor systems of small mammals. There are four aims within IRG4. Aim one will examine properties of the peripheral mechanics in these animals. Aim two will examine the, how spinal interneurons encode the limb state. Aim three will examine how animals in situ and intact animals respond to different types of perturbations. And then aim four will examine how descending systems modulate and modify our spinal properties according to task demands. AIM-1 will examine peripheral mechanics. This will involve experimental measurements of mechanical properties in animals. And then we'll take that information and use it to create biomechanical models that recapitulate the properties we observed in experiments. We'll also create robotic platforms using uh, muscle-like actuators that will also recapitulate and capture the mechanical properties we observed in experiments. And so AIM-1 will establish the computational and robotic platforms necessary to evaluate scale-dependent control strategies. In AIM-2, we will record from populations of spinal interneurons, as well as sensory and motor units, to evaluate how these different elements encode the state of the limb. And we'll ask the specific question whether the integration of position, velocity, and force coding by these different elements reflects the scale in which these animals are operating. We'll then take these results and use it to create a neuromechanical model of the spinal cord interacting with the, the mechanical, proper, mechanical limb that we're studying, and so that the, the neural networks within our simulation capture the properties of the neurons that we observed in our experiments. In AIM-3, we'll look at exam, examining behaving animals, recording from EMGs and XROM kinematics of these animals as they walk or stand, and then um, what will apply perturbations to these animals, either using an external exoskeleton attached to the animal, or as the animals walk or stand on a, an actuated platform. We'll then, and then, so we'll observe the, how they respond to those perturbations, and then compare those to our predictions from our neuromechanical and robotic implementations of the, the properties we observed in AIM-1 and 2.
And overall, what we'll be examining here is whether the control strategies used by these animals to respond to perturbations reflects the mechanical scale in which they operate. And finally, in AIM-4, we'll examine how descending systems modulate and modify sensory coding by spinal interneurons according to task demands. Look, recording from populations, specific populations of interneurons under different descending um, inputs and evaluate how sensory coding is being modified. We'll then take these principles identified in these experiments, implement them in our neuromechanical and robotic systems to evaluate whether they represent novel strategies for task switching in these artificial applications. So those are the experiments in modeling of, a, of IRG4 in small mammals. These will be taking place at the same time as the experiments in Aplysia and Drosophila and the other IRGs. And so we'll be able to make these comparisons of the properties of descending systems or peripheral systems in the spinal cord or, or peripheral ganglia and how they re reflect the scale that these animals are operating in. And of course, underlying all these experiments is the strong theory of IRG1, which will make it, give us ways to make predictions and evaluate our experimental results and make these comparisons. And so over the course of this Neuronex, the C3 CNS project, we hope to um, perform this collaborative and interdisciplinary research to identify general principles of motor control and to determine how the control strategies used by the nervous system reflect the mechanical scale that each organism operates within. All right, uh, I'm very uh, glad to uh, share the progress of our UCLA Neuronex Center. Our goals are to design, uh, build, test, optimize, and share new miniaturized microscope and electrophysiology tools. And uh, we, as five, uh, six of us are at UCLA and we have Ali Pasha Vaziri at the Rockefeller. Uh, the first uh, goal that we've accomplished is that we've redesigned our version three miniaturized microscope that has already been released uh, to the public. The version four miniaturized microscope has a larger field of view. Uh, it has uh, elect electrical focusing um, and uh, it uh, has a much more sensitive camera. It's about half the weight of the previous version. Uh, we've already released this version to the public. Uh, 154 V4 mini scopes have been shipped uh, and uh, the Open EFIS uh, production facility is handling all this dissemination and it's going really well to about 15 countries so far. Uh, we've been able to modify the V4 uh, scope to add an electrophysiology component. The, this allows us to do 32 channel electrophysiology and calcium imaging simultaneously um, and, uh, and uh, to implant the, the silicon probe and the, the miniature microscope together. Uh, everything gets uh, digitized and uh, sent out of a single coaxial wire. Um, these microscopes are already working and we're working on disseminating them to other labs as well. The center is disseminating silicon microprobes that are manufactured under the guidance of Soteris Masmanidis. These cost around $200 to $400. And we've uh, shared over 700 probes with 40 labs outside of UCLA. Multiple labs at UCLA are using them as well. This is going extremely well. Uh, the, the next goal was to design uh, and build a real-time data analysis component that works with FPGAs. This is work done by Tad Blair and Jason Kong. Uh, here, uh, imaging is done through a miniature microscope and this plugs into the real-time analysis FPGA unit here. For example, in CA1, uh, the pre-defined uh, uh, ROIs are, are identified and the next day these ROIs can be used for real-time data acquisition and analysis. And in CA1, we're able to record place cells, which then in real-time can allow us to decode the location of the animal in place. We hope that we will be able to do real-time uh, feedback as well. Um, the, the, the traces obtained with these, uh, this real-time analysis are very similar to that obtained by traditional analysis techniques, which take several days typically. Uh, and the last thing is that the center has developed a miniature light field microscope, which allows three-dimensional imaging. This is done by Ali Pasha Vaziri's lab. Uh, the first version has been published in Nature Methods, but the second version is based on the V4 microscope that Daniel Aroni has developed. And uh, these, these microscopes um, uh, will allow us to do three-dimensional imaging with one-photon uh, microscopy. 
uh, and uh, and uh, they're totally redesigned with better uh, lateral resolution and 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 hopefully we'll be able to uh, be disseminated to the public as well. And last thing is I would like to thank the NSF and the NIH Brain Initiative programs for funding our work and uh, all the all the information on how these uh, uh, how these um, technologies are being disseminated is available through miniscope.org. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Francois St. Pierre. I'm a uh, PI at uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston um, with many of my lab members from Rice University. Uh, I'm, um, I have a Neuronext Innovation Award with uh, Andreas Dolias also at uh, Baylor. So we, um, we got this Innovation Award back in 2017. Um, it's been, it was a two-year award uh, where we, the goal was to, to develop a platform that will help us uh, accelerate the development of genetically encoded voltage indicator uh, for imaging uh, voltage in vivo uh, under two photon microscopy. Uh, we uh, uh, did develop uh, some, some good sensors and now since 2019, so under a dissemination supplement, we've been focusing on, on uh, uh, you know, disseminating both reagents and expertise to other labs. So uh, the, our key sensor uh, is called JEDI2P, our flagship sensor, and it's an indicator that's really optimized for multi-photon voltage imaging. It's, it's, uh, it's based on GFP, and it dims down upon depolarization and brightens up upon hyperpolarization. Its peak is at 920, so similar to GCAMP. Uh, it's well localized at the membrane, and it's also fast, uh, some millisecond fast. Uh, it works in vivo. Uh, so uh, Jake Reimer and Andres Dolias has shown that you can target it uh, to the soma. So, so you can get these little rings. As you can see, this is in layer 2, 3 of area V1. Uh, and, and you can record from, from these and um, with, uh, in freely moving uh, behaving mouse. And you can see both subthreshold activity and, and spike. And it's also very photostable. So you can do uh, uh, physiological experiments. So our focus is to uh, have other labs also enjoy these tools and we develop a series of AAVs uh, that with uh, different uh, promoter, Cree dependency, some localization, serotypes. So for example, we have a Cree dependent uh, AAV with, uh, where a Jedi 2P is under EF1 alpha uh, control. It's somewhat localized and then caps at serotype five. And we have a bunch of other, other variants uh, as you can see here, on the, like for example, the synapsin variant that's uh, uh, without soma localization zero, and zero type nine. So you can ask us if you're if you're interested in like a specific combination, and we're making new ones also with different promoters that we have the plasmids for, and we can produce if you're interested. Uh, we distribute uh, free aliquots, so you can just ask us, and then to get you going. And we have a transgenic mouse that's on the progress, been a little bit delayed because of the pandemic. We also develop flies, Jedi flies with a clandidin lab and some regions of uh, uh, transient uh, expression plasmids for, uh, for fish, zebra fish. So this is the team. Um, this is my lab on the left. Uh, Shijuan, Helen and Michelle have been the key for dissemination. Uh, Andreas and Jake um, uh, from the, the Tolias lab. And, and a lot of folks have also been involved in the development of Jedi 2P itself. So more on the, the screening and then the platform and benchmarking. Uh, with that, thank you very much, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Hi, I'm uh, Jacob Robinson from Rice University. Uh, we are a Neuronex Innovation Award uh, called Southwest Magnetogenetics Project SOMA. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the work that we've done to create fast magnetic control of neural circuits. Um, importantly, I want to uh, highlight the people who've done the heavy lifting here. Uh, graduate student, very talented, Charles Sebesta, uh, research scientist in my lab, Guillaume DeRay, Herman Derrick at Baylor College of Medicine, and Caleb Camary uh, at Rice. And the goal of what we wanted to do was to create a technology like optogenetics that would allow us to have cell type specific control of neural circuits. But unlike optogenetics, we could control the cells remotely using magnetic fields that penetrate through the skull and through tissue and can affect the tissue uh, in the brain and the nervous system uniformly. And to be able to do this control over the, a large volume in a way that was orthogonal to natural senses. Now, the idea is that in nature, 
there are animals that can sense magnetic fields, but we don't know how these receptors work. So maybe we can engineer our own receptors by using nanomaterials that can create heat when we apply a magnetic field and thermal receptors that can convert that heat into um, a physiological signal. Now this idea of magnetothermal genetics uh, exists and it allows people to use these magnetic nanoparticles to activate thermal receptors. This has been shown by Polina Anakiva's lab and Arn Prowl's lab. However, the current technology is slow, much slower than optogenetics. In fact, it takes about 30 seconds for this mouse to respond to a magnetic stimulus. And for many applications, we felt like that wasn't fast enough temporal control. I wanted to be able to think, how can we create this magnetic control that would operate very quickly? And the idea is that the reason why some of these mechanisms are slow is that I have to heat the tissue up to a threshold and that takes time. Now I could lower that threshold, maybe I could achieve this activation a lot more quickly, but then I would be susceptible to natural fluctuations and a lot of off-target effects. So the idea is maybe we could create rate sensors that could turn on very quickly because when we turn the magnetic field on, the rate of temperature change is very high and that doesn't happen naturally. And what we showed last year is that this idea works and we were able to demonstrate this in flies, where here's a fly that has nanoparticles and this rate sensitive thermal receptor trip A1. Now see when we turn the magnetic field on in gray, we immediately activate uh, the FRU circuit that causes this animal to extend its wings. When we turn the magnetic field off from gray to white, we see we have this remote magnetic control of the uh, uh, so select neural circuit that is reversible. We turn it on, we turn it off, it responds very quickly. Now, as of last year, we had to take a big important step and that was can we translate this idea into mammalian cells? Now to do that, we screened a large number of uh, thermal receptors to discover other thermal receptors that were rate sensitive, but importantly were active at 37 degrees C. We have now expressed these cells, uh, these channels, excuse me, in mammalian cells. These are HEK cells that show a fast response to that magnetic stimulation. Uh, this is both seen in calcium and in voltage. And with our voltage imaging, we're now observing less than 100 millisecond response times in these cells, approaching what we can get with optogenetics. So we're, uh, importantly, we're reaching the point where we can have this fast temporal control remotely with magnetic fields. Where we're going next is to apply these to other species, zebrafish, mice, and then a manuscript. Um, I wanna thank um, everybody who helped us get started, importantly, the Neuronex uh, who helped us um, at the early stages of this, this has since been picked up by uh, DARPA and the Welch Foundation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chitampra Allen from Rice University, and I want to talk to you today about graph quilting. The motivation for this work is studying neuronal connectivity. We have, of course, physical or structural connectivity, but what we're interested in is estimating functional connections. These are statistical dependencies between neurons based on their activities and their firing patterns. There's many ways to estimate functional connectivity, but we're focused on probabilistic graphical models and using theoretical machine learning techniques to estimate these graph structures. In particular, we have every node in our graph is a neuron that's being recorded from our image. And our goal is to learn the edge structure between these neurons where each edge denotes a conditional dependence relationship that is explaining the neural activity we're observing in the recordings. But there's many new technologies such as large scale two photon calcium imaging where you want to record from say hundreds of thousands of neurons at a single time. Well, it's not possible to record with any temporal re resolution all 100,000 neurons at once. So instead, most people record from horizontal layers in the brain one at a time. And there's some overlap between the neurons recorded in each layer. So for example, you might record on these slices like this, but then you're not recording from all neurons jointly. And there's several pairs of neurons for which we have no simultaneous recordings. So here we have a large chunk of data. We've got some neurons for which we've got pairs of joint observations, but we've got a huge chunk of neurons that have no joint data. The question we ask is, can we estimate a probabilistic graphical model when we don't have these joint data observations? In other words, you can think of this as, we don't even have an estimate of a marginal dependence or an interaction between these pairs of neurons how on earth can we estimate a conditional dependence relationship for a probabilistic graphical model? So without any additional assumptions, the answer is just a big fat no. 
Uh, we proved that uh, definitively. And for a while working on this problem, we didn't think this was actually possible to solve. But it turns out, and this is really cool, we actually can solve this problem. So under certain assumptions with high probability, we can show that we can exactly record, exactly recover the graph structure of the pairs of neurons that we have observed jointly, and we get a minimal superset of edges that we didn't observe jointly. And this is a minimal superset because the graph is not identifiable for those. But when we apply this to real calcium imaging, I'm showing you a slice of the brain here, you see that this is the true graph structure of the brain, and with chunks of this missing, we can still recover largely the graph structure of real calcium imaging using our techniques. Thank you very much. Okay, that was the last of our, our presentations. And now we're going to move on to the uh, questions and the answers. And I see there's a, a number of them in the chat. What I'm gonna ask is, um, I'm gonna start with Tatiana Sharpie. Um, can you um, answer, ask your question uh, live? Like we were actually live instead of remote, um, instead of me reading your question. So my question was um, in the aplasia, um, as it grows, does it change its position on this uh, interesting bifurcation diagram that was shown in RG1 um, that, you know, it becomes uh, kind of some uh, animals are on the boundary. And I was wondering whether the animal, when it grows, whether it shifts or does it stay on, on one side of the bifurcation diagram? So, Tatiana, that's a great question. The interesting thing is um, uh, Roger didn't have time to show that diagram in detail, there are some behaviors that cross from one boundary to another. For example, human finger tapping, it turns out, as you go from very slow to moderate to extremely fast, does cross some of the boundaries. But interestingly enough, the aplysia is deep enough in the quasi-static regime that, uh, as far as we know so far, it stays in that regime. And that's one of the reasons we're studying it, because it turns out that some of the smaller animals, like insects when they walk, actually can cross from the quasi-static to the viscous regime. And I think there's going to be some very interesting control issues that that raises. But it looks to us as if the particular animal we've chosen is going to stay within one regime, but will have to deal with a several order of magnitude change in its uh, size and masses, even though the, the uh, biomechanical regime within which it lives is not really fundamentally changing. But that's a great question. That's one of the reasons we're looking at a whole array of different animals. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, now, um, uh, Joshua, you have a question. Um, Did, would you like me to ask it out loud? Yes, please. So this is a question for, for Vicky and, and maybe Hillel as well. I just, I just found it interesting that you're studying aplesia and you're using deep learning methods. And people talk about how intelligent we our machine learning and artificial intelligence is. And I wonder, you're comfortable with both. So what's your perspective? Are your deep learning methods smarter than your aplesia or vice versa? Vicky, why don't you take it first? Sure. So, um, yeah, quantifying intelligence. Uh, it's kind of a, a loaded question, too. And maybe I'm, I'm, I'm still a little bit of a, a deep learning skeptic in that the deep learning is going to be as intelligent as your training approach, right? And we, we can do a lot to accidentally bias these systems. We know that uh, depending on how you train it, you can get problems with convergence, you can get catastrophic forgetting, uh, where you might have learned a behavior previously, but by training a new one, you're going to lose that learning. Um, and one of the reasons that, that we're excited to bring deep learning approaches to this project is Aplysia affords us the opportunity with these carbon fiber arrays that were developed by uh, Dr. Shestick's lab in the, in the previous NeuronX that we can measure from a large subset of the neurons involved in these behaviors. Uh, the ganglias that we're studying only have about 2,000 neurons uh, each, I think, I'll defer that one to Hillel, but it's a relatively small number. And so uh, what, we're, what we're proposing with, with this hybrid approach uh, is to, for the first time, be able to compare the more physiologically based synthetic nervous system type neural modeling to conventional approaches in machine learning in trying to predict motor behavior from neural activity, but also create a hybrid framework in which we actually integrate 
models of known neural circuitry and then use the deep learning to learn the rest of the network architecture that maybe we haven't found via electrophysiology and connectomics yet. So I'm, I'm not sure I, I want to put my foot down on which is more intelligent yet, uh, but I think it's, it's a really unique opportunity to, to explore the space of explainable AI in deep neural networks. Uh, let me just jump in. Uh, trying to use um, artificial neural networks for problems like autonomous car driving, I happen to know this because my son is working for a startup, is very, 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 very difficult. Um, and there are two issues that are involved. Um, when, you're, when you're an animal, you're embodied, you have sensory feedback coming in all the time, and you're integrating that with the motor output. Most artificial neural networks don't have that natural structuring, and it's not clear for most people how to impose it. And to build on what Vicky is saying, if we can actually see how that works in the slug, that may give us some ideas for architectures for the future. The other thing is that the nodes in an artificial neural network are deliberately quite simple in general, um, because that makes it tractable and makes it easy to simulate. But in real nervous systems, those of us who are neuroscientists know that um, a single neuron can do an extraordinary amount of processing, both because of its shape and because of its internal conductances. So you multiply that by tens of thousands, uh, the quality of what you can do goes up, even if the switching times are orders of magnitude slower than what you see in, in uh, current transistors. So that, I think, are the, the kinds of comparisons. But the deeper question you're raising is how would you measure that? And again, I think you'd have to take a functional operational view. How, do, how well does it do the task? How well does it respond to perturbations? Can it learn from experience to do a better job? The slugs are not bad at it. They manage to survive and reproduce in pretty complicated environments. Um, and if we had uh, our, our robots working in well enough that they did the same thing, then, I, then we could start to make a direct comparison. Yeah, my two cents on this topic is uh, I'm a modeler and a robotics person. Um, and what I've learned from years of working with Hillel and other biologists, one thing I have is a great deal of respect for pretty much all animals. I initially had thought sea slug, you know, how smart could they possibly be? And then, and then actually, as you try to model it and try to understand what it's doing, how it's doing it, I, I'm... I'm always impressed by the biology. I don't know if that, um, so if we move on to the next question, it's actually from Vicki. Um, Vicki, you have, you have a question. Uh, yes, and I think Paven may have mentioned it in the chat as well, but um, my question was on what kind of impact the mini scope has on the locomotion <laughs> for a mouse uh, and how that compares to conventional head stages being you know, someone who does not work in mice at all. Yeah, I, I think as long as you keep the weight low uh, and the profile sort of not not too top heavy, they they do find. Uh, that being said, we've never actually done formal uh, studies on locomotion. Uh, we have wire-free versions where the animals are not tethered by a wire at all, and they tend to do best uh, with that. I think because they can travel large distances, but if there are ways of formally assessing locomotion, we would be happy to collaborate and see which profiles do best. We have a, the next question was from from, um, from Ed uh, Edward Calloway. Um, would you please like to uh, voice voice your uh, question? Sure. Um, although Francois also answered it already in the chat, and I was just asking. Um, how many neurons you can image simultaneously at fast enough frame rates to get spike times uh, uh, using two photon imaging in these sensors? Because my interest would be in being able to do cross-correlation analysis to identify uh, cell pairs that are connected. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and as uh, I was saying, essentially, we're, we're limited mo mostly by the optical techniques uh, for imaging the sensors than the sensor itself. Although this is not to say that we don't have a lot of work to do to increase their brightness and, and response amplitude and so forth. Um, I mean, I think the main limitation for the for the number of neurons is really like the field of view. And like, even if you use a resonance scanner uh, and you want to use it paired with Jedi 2P, which has, you know, some millisecond uh, response amplitude, you need to image at least at like around a kilohertz, maybe even a little faster, ideally. 
Uh, and that only gives you something like, I forget the exact number, eight or 16 rows um, uh, times, you know, 512 pixels. So, so that's a, a very small strip. And depending on the density of cells that um, you have in this specific area and how you, you, you did your genetic targeting, um, you might just be looking at one or a few cells. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of labs that are developing new techniques to solve this problem now that indicators are becoming better and worth looking at. Um, so, so there are random access, especially for, for ads application, there, there are random access uh, uh, techniques so it would allow you to, to choose the cells of interest in three dimensions and just go quickly between them. So Steph, Stefan Dudonne in Paris uh, and others, you know, I've been I've been sparing this uh, right now. Um, I don't think they've they've, they've, they've shown it for um, uh, for multiple cells, but they're working towards that direction. I will revo probably involve like getting some new lasers at specific rep rate and so forth. Um, there are other techniques such as, you know, for those that want to look at it, I won't go in detail, but Naji and Elizabeth Hillman and others also have, have ways to increase the field of view. Uh, but I'll say, all right, uh, but right now, um, the good thing is that even if you can look only have a few cells, it's already better than patching. So if you do need to get that electrical activity, you can do that small strip, but then just go from neuron to neuron quickly. So you can capture many neurons, but not at the same time. Thank you. Um... Martin Fisher has a statement here, which I think he'd like to turn into a question. Um. Hi, Roger. Hi. I was actually thrilled by the panel's presentation on this miniscope, and uh, it relies to what Ricky said. Uh, do we have any evaluation or validation on how it performs on a moving animal? Um, and we could simply test this as well. Yeah, that'd be terrific. I'd be happy to do whatever I can to make it happen. If Martin has a uh, apparatus, so he does a high-speed video X-ray uh, two planes, so he can get three-dimensional motion of uh, of uh, skeletons as they as animals walk. It's uh, so that would be a great place to test it. Um, could really find out if it if it does in fact impact the motion of the animal or not. If it doesn't, it'd be a wonderful addition to the arsenal. Okay, so um, just to add, payment uh, the device we have we cannot take up to two thousand X rays per second. So we could even see very small movements on the head or wherever you are. So this could really be a chance to 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 put this in place for locomotion studies. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I mean, it also gives you a chance of looking at correlates, neural correlates of very fine movements, I think. That's exactly, this is where we are heading to. And so we can see whenever we have, we have the shaking plate. And so we can, we probably can see at the, and the question is how long does the periphery solves this on its own and when we have a central impact on this and if we could record this directly uh, with your device this would be an enormous step forward yeah that sounds great okay great sounds like we have another collaboration about to happen so um we have another question from uh it, is, it was discussed in the chat but i think it's good to bring these things out and, and hear the discussion uh from yusaka Antani. Uh, there's a question. Uh, yes, yes. I ask it to Jacob. How strong magnetic field is needed to activate neurons? And also I asked molecular engineering wise, how could you possibly improve the magnetic sensors? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I, I mentioned it in the, in the chat as well, but we typically use magnetic fields on the order of 20 to 80 millitesla. Um, we can drop those fields potentially if we can engineer a stronger response. And we can engineer a stronger response in one of two ways. Um, we can have better magnetic nanoparticles that heat more efficiently. And there's work that we're doing with some collaborators in material science to increase a specific absorption rate of those particles. The other thing that we can do to increase the efficiency is to have um, better thermal receptors. And, and by better, I mean thermal receptors that either have a lower threshold or are more rate sensitive. 
and I think that rate sensitivity is a better approach because as you drop the threshold, you end up with a little bit of spontaneous activity. If there's thermal fluctuations, you want to try to avoid that. And so techniques to create more rate dependent responses in these thermal receptors, I don't know how to do it, but if there are people out there who have good ideas, I think that would be a really fantastic approach, have a big impact. And the last discussion in the chat was uh, from Yehuda, uh, also for, for Jacob. Uh, Yehuda, do you, do you want to just answer, ask your question? Sure. I mean, I mean, one thing that um, was kind of striking is how the, and I think this is relevant not just for magnetic activation, but probably for for any other um, heat or light or any other method is that at least in flies where we have genetic tools that we can control uh, expression of whatever the sensor is spatially, we we almost all elements of the circuits are 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 um, symmetric and and so often what you see with activation you see ectopic behaviors because the the activity of the uh, when you activate both sides i mean in reality the circuit is probably not uh, uh, to generate a behavior in a in a in a, in a more sort of a nat naturalistic way the, the you, you can't activate everything at the same time and so the question was basically is is there a way with with magnetic fields that you can actually end up, you know, you, you control with genetics where your sensor is, but with the stimulus field, you can go have a even higher um, spatial resolution that can, so we can start understanding really how the circuit is driving the behavior that we see in a in a wild type animal. Um, and it sounds like in the fly at least that would be very difficult right now. Yeah, I think getting the spatial control with magnetic fields is very challenging because we don't, there's no real way to focus magnetic fields. So you're really limited to the size of the coil. So for large animals, we've been looking at ways that we can make coil arrays for non-human primates and potential for, for clinical translation. Um, but for small animals, um, spatial control is probably going to be um, uh, all, only achieved by, by genetic methods. So either the expression pattern of your thermoreceptors mm -hmm. or where you inject the nanoparticles. We've looked at ways to functionalize the nanoparticles so that they would bind to specific cell types. But again, it's really a genetic control strategy. I don't, I, I don't see an easy way for us to control the magnetic field strength on the spatial scale of less than about a centimeter. Well, one idea I had, and I don't know if it's realistic or not, this might be naive, but if, if the particles themselves can respond to the magnetic field during early development, if you inject it to the embryo actually really early and there's enough, one could, in the syncytial phase, like actually keep all the magnetic, like let's say on one, one half of the animal, and then allow it to develop, and then they get trapped in the cells once, once and, and so then, right? And that could be one way of possibly ending up with, sort of genetics, how you control the distrib spatial distribution of the elements, and then, and then you can apply, yeah. So that could be pretty cool if that works. That's super cool. I'll also mention that one thing we're exploring, we have some really good preliminary data, is um, different magnetic nanoparticles have different resonances, so to speak. And mm. so we can change the frequency and strength of the magnetic field to activate one group of nanoparticles versus another group. And so if you have this idea of how you could segregate the nanoparticles, you could actually have two populations of nanoparticles that you could turn on at different times. I think. Yeah, that would be a good cool idea. Um, that actually officially uh, ends, uh, we're supposed to end at 2.35. And so we can move on to the, uh, the next event. Um, but thank you very much.